Let's have a look at magnetic fields. A few videos ago we had a video called the three fields and we talked about the three fields that we explore in this course. The gravitational field which is caused by mass and has units of newtons per kilogram. And then we talked about electric fields which are caused by charge and have units of newtons per coulomb. And then the magnetic fields were caused by moving charges and they had units of newtons per coulomb times meter per second, which has another name. It's called a Tesla. Now, your familiarity with magnetic fields is probably pretty much limited to bar magnets. Now, are there moving charges within a bar magnet? Well, there aren't any currents, but remember, everything in the universe is made of atoms, and in any atom, you've got electrons that circle the nucleus. And it turns out when an electron circles the nucleus, it kind of effectively creates a tiny little bar magnet. And that bar magnet would have a south end and a north end. So any atom can create its own magnetic field. Now, in truth, it's a little more complicated than that. There's something called electron spin, and, and that gives a more complete explanation. But for us right now, this is good enough. You might not know as well that uh, if you have two current carrying wires, two current carrying wires like so, then those two wires will develop a force between them because each of the wires creates a magnetic field around it. And we'll talk more about that magnetic field, but the magnetic fields of the two wires interact and that creates a force between the wires. Turns out that force between the wires is what's used to define an ampere but we'll talk more about that later. So let's say we've got a material that's ferromagnetic. That means it forms permanent magnets. Inside that ferromagnetic material, there are tiny little microscopic regions that we call domains. And what happens inside those domains is that the magnetic fields of all the atoms align in one direction. So in any one of these domains, there's an overall magnetic field. Now, if we drop a magnet a bunch of times, it'll become demagnetized. And what that means is that these domains will be ordered quite randomly. Now, if we take our bar magnet and we place it in a strong magnetic field, those domains will line up. This would be a strong magnet here, where all the domains line up together and all point in the same direction. And they therefore produce a very strong magnetic field. If we drop our magnet, it will become unmagnetized and all the domains will be randomly orientated. Notice here that if you have a bar magnet, you always have a south pole and a north pole. We say that there's no isolated magnetic poles. You can never just get a north pole. It's not like with charge where you can get a positive charge or a negative charge. Every south pole comes with a north pole. Every north pole comes with a south pole. And even if you break your magnet in half, you'll still get two tiny little magnets. They won't quite be as strong as the original, uh, but you could continue to do this and produce more and more little magnets. Let me give you a very brief warning. Uh, it's certainly true that electric and magnetic forces are connected because one's about charges, one's about moving charges. Uh, but where I often see students uh, go wrong, especially earlier in, in their study, is they start thinking that, say, positive charges are attracted to north poles. Keep the two fields separate. So yes, north poles and south poles will attract, and positive and negative charges will attract. But don't start thinking as, as yet about, say, north poles attracting positive charges or repelling negative charges, etc. Okay, the magnetic field of a bar magnet, you probably put down iron filings before around a bar magnet and saw field lines that look something like the ones below. And we could put arrows on those field lines. They would always be coming out of the North Pole and they would be going in to the South Pole. So the field lines would look, look like that. And we get a very concentrated, very strong field inside the magnet. And you can see that the field lines are very close together. Another thing to notice is that all the field lines are in these continuous loops, like so. The field lines are, are always in loops.
if we have a compass, a compass always points in the direction of the field lines. So this little compass here, it's uh, indicating a north field that's directly downwards. So an appropriate place or where that might occur is right here because you can see that the field line coming down here is downwards just like the needle on the compass. This compass here, an appropriate place for it might be say about here where once again the field line is tangential to the needle. And one more example, this compass here probably best represented right about here I'd say so that once again the field line comes along that way and the needle points tangential to that field line. So field lines always point from north pole to a south except be a little careful about this. Of course inside the magnet here if these are continuous loops then inside the magnet the field lines are pointing from south to north. And then compasses always point in the direction of the field lines. So what exactly is a compass? Well it's just a little bar magnet that's that's free to rotate. So this is a uh, the north end of a bar magnet. So let's say we put a horseshoe magnet up here and let's say this was a south end of that horseshoe magnet and this is this and this is the north end of the horseshoe magnet and we would create a, a uniform field in that horseshoe magnet going from one foot of the horseshoe magnet to the other and it would be the field lines are being directed upwards like this. Of course the north pole here and this, let's say this is a north pole as well it would be attracted to the south pole here and that rotates the magnet so that it always aligns with the magnetic field. The Earth itself, you can kind of think of it as a giant magnet. And in fact, the giant magnet Earth here has its North Pole on the South Pole of the Earth. And so that the field lines move around in this direction. And if we're, say, near the surface of the Earth here, take that out of the way, here near the surface of the Earth, the field lines are pointing from the South Pole or the geographical South Pole to the geographical North Pole. So, so it's kind of unusual in that the geographic North Pole is the South Pole of the giant magnet Earth. So the geographical North Pole is the South Pole of the giant magnet Earth. So when I take my compass and I put it on the surface of the Earth, it points north. If you take a compass to the south, to the North Pole, it uh, behaves strangely because, of course, the field lines here are coming straight down, and the compass will just kind of spin and act crazy. Okay, let's look at the magnetic field that's formed around a current-carrying wire. So we've got moving charges in a in a current-carrying wire. That means a magnetic field will be created. Turns out the magnetic field lines will circle the wire. So here's our current carrying wire and current is heading upwards right now and we need to use a hand rule to tell whether or not those the magnetic field is going to circle clockwise or counterclockwise. And so if we use conventional current where we're kind of picturing positive charges flowing then we use our right hand for conventional current. And what we do is we point our thumb in the direction of the current and when we do that our hands will wrap around in a certain direction either in a clockwise or a counterclockwise direction and so in this case we know if the current's going upwards in the wire the magnetic fields will go around this way which is a clockwise direction now of course if the current's going the opposite direction the magnetic field lines will circle in the opposite way and what that means for a compass is that if i were to place this compass in behind the wire where the compass would point in the direction it is in right now. If I were to bring the compass to the side here, then the magnetic field would be pointing out towards, out of the page. And if I bring the compass to the front of the wire out here, then of course it's going to point to the right. And finally, if I bring my compass over here to the side of the wire, then the compass would point into the page. 
Often you'd be asked to to draw the magnetic field around a current carrying wire and typically you do a cross-sectional view like the one that you're seeing below. So what you're seeing here is that this is the wire coming out of the page. And then we'd have to put in whether or not that we'd have to know whether the current is flowing out of the page or into the page and for practical purposes let's say the current is going out of the page so that's the point of the arrow coming out towards you. So we'd use our hand rule and right hand rule our thumb would be coming out of the page and then our fingers would wrap around this way and that would mean that the magnetic field lines should go in this direction. But be careful on these diagrams often what is neglected is that often students do not show that the spacing between the lines increases as you get farther away from the, the wire. Uh, the magnetic field varies as one over that distance from the center of the wire. So we've got to show that we've got longer spacing if we're farther from the wire, indicating a weaker magnetic field. Now if we take our current carrying wire and we wrap it so that it makes a loop, what you can see here is that we get lots of field lines enclosed in a fairly small area here. So we get a fairly, fairly strong field inside the loop itself. It passes right in, in the plane of the loop. It's going to be going horizontally straight through that loop. And then, of course, it bends outwards as you get farther away from the loop. Now, what's kind of more interesting than that is, let's say we keep wrapping our loop up more and more and more. So we get a whole bunch of coils. And we get what's called a solenoid when we do that. So a solenoid is when you take a, a cylinder and you wrap wire around it very very tightly so that you get lots and lots of coils. Now the magnetic fields from each one of those individual coils is going to point in the same direction and all those magnetic fields are going to add up and augment each other. So you get this very strong magnetic field inside here. So you see here you get a, a strong uniform magnetic field or B field inside the loop. Now outside the loop it looks very much like a bar magnet with these loops going from a north pole and looping around into a into a south pole. So it's very much the same pattern as a bar magnet. And once again we'd like to know we would know the direction of the current say and we'd like to know well if this is like a bar magnet then which is the north end and the south end of that bar magnet um, which is really a solenoid. So we need a hand rule for that. And so here's our, our current. And let's imagine that we've got our current going through the wire in this direction. Then we wrap our fingers in the same direction. And if we do that, our thumb will point <coughs> in the direction of the magnetic field, which means our magnetic field is going to go like so. It's going to go upwards in this and so this becomes like the North Pole and this becomes like the South Pole if we were to compare it to a bar magnet. So, so this rule is kind of exactly the opposite, an exact reflection of the previous rule we had. So th in this one here we've got the current curling around and we get the B field with our thumb. Remember in the last one, we had the thumb being the current, and then the B field being what curled around the electric wire. Okay, so here's a IB question. What I'd like you to do is pause the video, try the question, and then come back for the answer. Okay, so uh, the first thing is they're telling us northeast and west, and that means they're involving the Earth's magnetic field. And we know that it will point, it will give a magnetic field in this direction. Now, the solenoid itself, if it's got a current in it, must be producing a magnetic field as well. And being as we've got a deflection in this direction, that means our magnetic field, due to the solenoid, must be in this direction. So that's B solenoid. This here is B earth. Now we can add those two 
magnetic field vectors to find out the resultant magnetic field and of course it's going to lie in about that direction, the direction that the compass points. So now if we double the current in the solenoid, and you've got to figure if you put a bigger current through the solenoid, you'll get a bigger magnetic field. And in fact, the field inside of a solenoid goes as a constant called the permeability of free space times the number of turns per unit length times the current. All we need to know right now, though, is that B varies directly as current. More current gives you a bigger magnetic field. So that means that our solenoid magnetic field is going to get longer, twice as long. And our Earth's magnetic field is going to stay the same size. We're not changing the Earth at all. Now if I add those two up, I get a resultant in about this direction, and then I look for the best match. That would be B here. So the best answer is B. Okay, let's do a brief summary of what we've been talking about. So magnetic fields are always caused by moving charges and the field lines they always point from a north to a south and that would be outside outside of any magnet or solenoid. Outside of magnet or solenoid. And compasses always point in the direction of the field lines. The field around a current carrying wire, we've got to use our right hand rule so we'd have our fingers wrapped around in the direction of the magnetic field and the thumb is in the direction of the current. So if this is a conventional current then our field lines are going to circle like so. And I'll try to draw those so that the gap is getting bigger as I get farther away from the wire. And in fact the size of that magnetic field goes as a constant called the permeability of free space times the size of the current divided by the distance from the wire. So, of course, the, the magnetic field drops off inversely with the distance. Now, if we've got a loop of wire, so I'll draw a loop here, then the magnetic fields kind of add up inside the loop. So, you get a fairly strong magnetic field in the loop, and the field lines will kind of bend outwards, like, like so, and with some loops around the wire itself. Now a loop of wire isn't so important for our purposes. What's really important is that if you have a whole bunch of loops of wire and you create yourself a solenoid, then you get a magnetic field pattern that looks very much like a bar magnet. And so let's suppose we draw our loops like so and we attach a battery to drive a current through that loop so let's say the current is going in that direction on the front of the solenoid it's heading upwards on the coil then we'd have to use our right hand rule so we'd have there's our knuckles and there's our thumb coming out and the current is looping around in that direction and our V field will be in this direction so this this side becomes like a north pole this like a south pole and the field lines are going to point outwards It'll be pretty much uniform inside the magnet, and then they kind of loop around outwards. And so the field gets rapidly gets weaker as you get farther away from the solenoid. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.